Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Bright Lights Online, presented by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and Entergy. I'm Erin Greenwald with the LEH, and I am delighted to kick off our Bright Lights Online series with our 2020 Humanities Book of the Year awardee, Albert Wood Fox. In normal times, the LEH would be hosting a gala to honor all of our Humanities Awards winners, but of course we are not in normal times. And so as an alternative, we have decided to present and shine the light on our awardees through the Bright Lights Online series, which we're starting today with Albert Wood Fox. Um, next week, we'll have Lifetime Contribution to the Humanities awardee, Warren Perrin, who's known for his advocacy uh, on behalf of Cajun and Acadian culture. He'll be in conversation with the University of Louisiana at Lafayette's director, uh, I'm sorry, Center for Louisiana Studies director, Josh Caffrey. Uh, the following Friday, we will shine a light on our Champion of Culture awardee, LSU Press, and I will be in conversation with LSU Press director, Elisa Plant. On January 8th, we will recognize another of our lifetime contribution to the humanities awardees, Linda and Bertney Langley of the Cushada tribe of Louisiana. And they will be in conversation with Arizona State University historian, Denise Bates. We'll wrap up Bright Lights Online on January 15th with the Michael P. Smith Memorial Award for Documentary Photography honoree, Charles Lovell, who'll be in conversation with Music Inside Out host, Gwen Tompkins. Today's program, you guys will only be able to see the speakers. Um, we're going to ask that any questions you have, you type into the Q&A feature. Uh, all of the speakers will see that Q&A feature. And when we come to the end of our interview with Jackie and Albert, we will move to the questions. And so I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone. Our moderator today is Jackie Summel. Jackie is an artist and activist whose work is at the intersection of abolition, social practice, and contemplative studies. She has spent the last two decades working directly with incarcerated people, most notably her elders, Herman Wallace and Albert Wood Fox. Her work has been exhibited extensively throughout the United States and Europe. She's based here in New Orleans, we're very fortunate where she continues to work on Herman's House, Solitary Gardens, The Prisoner's Apothecary, and several other community-generated advocacy-based projects. Our star of today's program is the 2020 Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities Book of the Year awardee, Albert Wood Fox, whose book, Solitary, My Story of Transformation and Hope, recounts the story of the Angola Three, and they are Herman Wallace, Robert King, and Albert Wood Fox. These are three men held for decades in solitary confinement in the closed cell restricted or CCR unit at the Louisiana State Penitentiary, better known as Angola, for a crime they did not commit, which was the 1972 murder of prison guard Brent Miller. Albert Wood Fox was born in 1947 here in New Orleans. He was a committed activist in prison and he remains so today. He speaks to a wide, a wide array of audiences, including ours. He, um, his book has been published around the world. It's won numerous awards. It's been published in the UK, Canada, Australia, Spain, Germany, and Brazil. And I bet there are more coming on that list. In fact, there might already be more. Solitary was also a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Please welcome. Jackie Summel and Albert Woodfox. Thank you so much. You on Fox? Yeah, I'm ready. Hey, okay. Aaron, thank you so much for that generous um, introduction. It's kind of funny because <clears throat> we can't see the audience. Um, I just see Fox and I see you which is actually very nice um, because in a lot of ways, it's uh, a reminder or invokes a memory of the 16 years um, where I had the great honor and privilege of visiting you, Fox, um, and just having these casual conversations, chopping it up in um, and creating some sense of humanity for myself um, and the direction of my life. 
And when I have the opportunity to speak publicly about my work or, you know, um, the national campaign to end the inhumane practices of isolation or solitary confinement, I always begin with gratitude for my elders, Wood Fox, Herman King, Walimu, Norris Henderson, and all without whom I would not have these opportunities. Um, and I would like to say to you through Zoom um, that you know if it wasn't for your great tutelage, your patience, and your love, I would never be able to um, to be able to do this work. So thank you, Wood Fox. I thank you for putting so much pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I've often, you know, come to understand that the strength of a chain is all of the links that, you know, are hooked together at John in unity and friendship and stuff. And, you know, knowing, getting to know you and uh, the wonderful work you've done, as you know, you find that you found this unique way of taking art and revolutionizing it and make it a part of social struggle. And uh, even to this day, with the uh, solitary gardens and and and, and Harmer's house, you know, which contributed greatly to uh, making the public aware of of the Angola tree and what Harmon, Robin, and I uh, have uh, endured. And so, me personally, I will forever be uh, grateful to you for the support and the love uh, and the, uh, the artistic uh, value that you brought to uh, what, you know, our, our pain and suffering, you know, uh, uh, putting it in a way that uh, everyday uh, person can understand uh, what we were going through, you know. And uh, I look forward to working with you and LEH uh, in the future and continue, you know, the honor Harmon, you know, uh, one of one of the most profound motivating factor uh, for me is the loss of Harmon only three days after winning his freedom. Uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, it's, you know, while I, there is a self motivation, uh, the fact that he, you know, there was a time when we all decided to make the ultimate pledge of sacrifice, uh, even at the, you know, the, the loss of life uh, is necessary for what we believed in. And Harmon uh, uh, is a wonderful example uh, of that sacrifice, you know. Uh, yeah. I wish, you know, of course I wish he was here with us now, but he lives yeah. on. Yeah, he lives on and, and, and every, every breath and how King and I take every word that we speak. Uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, I'm just honored, you know, uh, to be here, to be in this conversation. And I hope I have something to say that is interesting. You know, <laughs> people, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things that folks who um, aren't moving in and out of prisons and jails and detention centers don't recognize is that the, inter the most interesting things um, are often the most normal. You know, I remember the first time I reached out to y'all and I had never heard of solitary confinement. This is 2001, right? Pre-Michelle yeah. Alexander till I met King. And so there wasn't a national conversation around mass incarceration. And I said, I had like taped a, a disposable camera to my wrist and and taken a photo every hour on the hour, sent it to you and hooks and was like, here's 24 hours in my life. I can't imagine what yours is. And I, you know, they were photos of like my socks, my blanket, the, remember? <laughs> like the- I asked you, I had those photos somewhere. Yeah, the house. dashboard <laughs> of my truck, you know? And most of, you know, the so-called normal folks would have just thrown those away. They wouldn't be keepers. But I remember you and Herman both wrote back with 
such generosity and wonder and and gratitude and you were like i haven't seen the dashboard of a car in that long no one sent me pictures of their socks right like wow socks have changed in the last at that point 29 years and you know for me that was the language i was speaking as an artist is like what is where is this moment of wonder of beauty in the um in the everyday you know and I felt like that was our first, you know, shared space is your incredible ability to meet folks where they were at, including my ignorant self, my most ignorant self in 2001 and be like, you know what, Jackie, none of us are free till all of us are free. So like, you know, walk with me on this journey now, 19 years, Fox. I mean, you knew me before wrinkles, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Yeah, it's been quite a journey, you know, it's been a wonderful journey. I mean, uh, when I came home in uh, 2016, you know, uh, the one thing that I was worried about was, you know, up to that point, we had enjoyed such tremendous support, especially from the International Coalition, uh, yeah. uh, Free to go to Tree. And, you know, I, was overwhelmed with the support y'all gave, you know. Um, like you see, it was it, nothing special, just normal, just being there, just letting, letting me know that y'all was still a part of my life and that y'all would uh, continue to uh, help me uh, on this journey that I'm still taking, you know. And mm. uh, that, that, that means a lot, you know. Mm. It means a lot, it personified uh, what uh, the friendship that Robert and Harmon uh, and I endured for, you know, uh, from 29 years to 41 years to 44 years and 10 months, you know. Hmm. Yeah, well, at the very least, Fox, it's a, it's a reflection of who you are, you know, and how you and Herman in particular taught me to love and to be a better person. And, you know, a lot of that space was, like I said, just chopping it up with you about, you know, my bad hair days or like the, or, you know, sometimes we'd spar about politics, but a lot of the times you just ask me about the kids. And, you know, and- yeah, I'm very I, impressed uh, with, you know, the way you've thrown yourself into uh, trying to create a, a reality for these kids, giving them opportunities uh, over the years that they normally, because of uh, the ethnicity and the economic situation, they would have never had, never known, you know, uh, being being a beacon of light for them, you know, in darkest times, you know, and, and, and that's one of the things I love about you, you know, uh, and, uh, but all the other stuff, uh, that you do in social struggle, you, you, you know, you always find time for those kids, you know, and I'm sure that has made a great impact on the type of human beings they are and, and will be in the future. Mm. Thank you for saying that. I would never have done it if it wasn't for you or Herman. I really, you know, I really structured my life such that I would I would never have children. And, you know, I remember one day um, waking up after New Orleans flooded another time and um, it was me and Posner. And we just looked in our living room and we had, you know, six kids from the neighborhood sleeping head to toe um, on whatever mattress or soft thing we could figure out. And, you know, it was this moment where I was like, this is, fucking hard. This is really hard work. Um, and, and this is the work that I know Herman and, and Albert would do on the outside and, you know, proven to be true. Um, yeah. And, you know, without a doubt, and I think speaking to the audience, I didn't do it without you. Like many times I would bring the issues and troubles I was having with the Chinese into you. I'm like, how many times do I give them a second chance? I don't know if you remember that conversation. Yeah. The child who will not be named, who is an adult now. And you said as many as it takes. 
I'm like, damn it, Fox, that's not the answer I wanted, you know, like, I'm, I'm tired. Um, but, you know, as per usual, you were right. Um, yeah, and to this day, I'm getting emotional, but, you know, I can't, I can't do it without you, and I feel like I can't do it without Herman, and, you know, although Herman is no longer on this plane, he is very much, um, part of part of the conversation always you know I'm very much in touch with him yeah and um, um, he's sitting there with the ancestors now you know probably right now laughing you know you know that laugh he had you know yeah uh, you know there's not a day go by that I don't think about it you know and, yeah I mean Fox I have to tell you the book was really hard for me to read because you have written it. <laughs> it's hard to read. You know, one of the reasons I asked Les to uh, uh, work with me on the book uh, was, you know, when I initially started on the book myself, and I began to understand that I was avoiding certain uh, yeah. parts of my life that was so painful. You know, I just didn't want to go through it. You know, and I'm like, well. You're not going to be able to do this book justice if you know you you just write by yourself. You know you need you need to get some help. You know somebody that you know less uh, became part of the A3 family uh, in uh, in '98, uh, I think '97, '98, and she was a journalist working for Pacifica. She actually did the first. That's right. Uh, interview that I was allowed to do in about 30 something years. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, although the book is my life and my voice, you know, uh, her influence is throughout the book in the sense that she demanded honesty from me. Mm. And I, and here we are, 11,000 arguments away. <laughs> you know the book uh the book honestly the book has garnered more attention and more uh literary uh acknowledgement than i ever dreamed that wasn't even a part of the deal when i wrote the book i just want to say something to american people and people around the world the horrors of prison the horrors of solitary confinement you know i never thought about National Book Award or the Pulitzer uh, record nominations or uh, uh, the Stowe uh, and 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 uh, Louisiana Endowment of Humanity, none none of you know so many other uh, uh, organizations and community as well as a national organization. Uh, you know when when we were writing were writing this book, you know I just uh, there was something in me that just you know the people. Of this world need to know about this because yeah. most of this is being done in their name and the state individually and, and united across this country have had to absolute control of the narrative when they came to the prison system, you know, and what they did to uh, prison. So, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we are seeing some slow success in taking back uh, that narrative, you know, and, 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 and you know, uh, I think our, our greatest sense of responsibility uh, is to remind people that prisoners, they come from families. They don't come from another planet. You know, they come from families. They, they are sons, daughters, mothers, grandmothers, sisters, uh, uncles, you know, brothers, whatever, you know. And uh, in a sense, from, from my perspective, all African Americans in this country, uh, particularly those in prison, are political prisoners in the sense that we are the victim of a system that started in 1619 when the first slaves were brought to this country, to the American colonies, you know, and all we have endured uh, since that time, and although battered, beaten, murdered, raped, 
lynch hung you know uh, the one thing that has never been accomplished is that this system has never been able to break the spirit of, of, of African American people and so many other minorities and, and working class white people and poor people in this country. You know? Yeah, and we've just come through uh, four years of uh, the reemergence <coughs> and reemergence of white supremacy in this country. You know, who, who would ever dream? I mean, yeah. people have dreamt. They've dreamt this yeah. dream for 300 years, right? And, yeah. and you know, a star is um, its brightest right before it dies. Yeah. And I, I think in some ways I try to imagine this is the life and legacy of white supremacy is that we have this reemergence that's so loud, so bright because it's on its way the fuck out. Um, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't curse. I'm so sorry. I only see you, you well, know. that's the thing I like about you. You try to keep it real, you know. And, I have no choice, uh, right? I have no choice. Yeah, I, I, a blue collar. Time when I'm talking, I really struggle not to help <laughs> this and, you know, mother this and stuff, you know, so I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for that permission. Um, I don't know if, uh, the humanities agreed, but. Um, speaking of spirit and bringing spirit into the conversation, um, you know, reflecting on your book, the first spirit you invoke is that of your mom. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah. My first hero. Your first hero. And I think, you know, it would be nice if, you know, we've already had the opportunity to talk about our shared hero, Herman. Um, I'm sure I'll bring Walimu into the conversation. Walimu. Yeah, but maybe we could hear a little bit um, about your mom. Well, my mom, you know, uh, was a typical product of uh, racist America. Mm -hmm. uh, she was uh, wasted an opportunity in school. She could, she couldn't. The only thing she could read or write was, was uh, you know, her name. You know, because of the lack of uh, education uh, in the public school system back then, you know, being a, being a, a child of poverty and, and racism in this country. Those are some of the direct effects that it had on her. Uh, but uh, the hard experiences, the hard things in life uh, armed her with uh, tremendous wisdom and knowledge and strength, you know. And unfortunately for me, uh, I guess it was a typical teenage thing. I, you know, thought she was trying to control my life. I, you know, I really didn't begin to understand the strength and the wisdom of my mom until, you know, I uh, re-educate myself mm. and, you know, gain enough ex uh, wisdom from the experiences I was having to where I was able to define who I was. And the strangest thing about it is like, when I, you know, I became an avaricious reader, particularly uh, on history and social struggle and stuff. And it was strange because I would be reading something and I'm like, where well, I heard this at before? <laughs> I heard this before, you know? And imagine my surprise, you know, when I realized, you know, that these are things, and, and, and not in an intellectual way, but by example that my mom was teaching me, you yeah. know, and, and, and I'm how you know, I, we lost my mom in uh, 94 to cancer. As you know, you were a very big part of trying to bring as much comfort to her and, 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 and my sister as well when we lost them and how it caused her, you know, right. and, uh, I am very happy to, you know, say before, you know, the ancestors called her home. I was able to sit down with her and, you know, thank her for being the example she had been and, and letting her know that the foundation that allowed me to make the, the transformations from a petty criminal to a man of integrity, a revolutionary struggle, uh, were laid by her, you know, 
and not the great men and women, and in some case, children of history that I read about, but about by her. You know, here this woman functionally illiterate, but had so much wisdom, so much internal strength. Yeah. And as you know, in the book, uh, I wrote this book called Echoes. You know? Yeah, a poem. Yeah, this poem, uh, excuse me, uh, this poem called Echoes, because even now I still hear echoes from my mom, you know, or sometimes, you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, you know, I don't know all, and, and, and there are times when I become very, uh, uh, you know, uh, confused uh, about something or angry or whatever, and I can hear her voice, I can hear her some of the things she used to say to me, you know, that I had absolutely no idea as a young man. And uh, so that, that poem was a, a tribute to her in particular, but to all mothers, all women uh, yeah. in, in, in this world, you know, who, who, you know, in spite of the oppression and the exploitation, do a tremendous job in raising men uh, in, in, in this country, in this world, you know. Yeah. Walimu used to say, um, I told you I was going to bring Walimu into the conversation. He used to say, it takes all the tiny grains of sand to hold back the oceans of oppression. Yes. You know, and when I think about or reflect on what you just said and all the different ways that maybe your mom didn't intellectualize Fanon, you know, it was all these tiny grains of sand that were actually pointing us in the same direction. Yeah. You know that. Uh, I mean, it was crazy. Like I see, I'd be reading uh, 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 books and uh, and and I'm like, I read this before, but I can't remember when. You know. And, yeah. And I I was attributed to, you know, uh, some of the people I read about, particularly in African American history, and then it dawned on me. You know, my mom used to say this. My yeah. mom, you know, she didn't say it like this, but she said it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, 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 but, you know, again, I'm, you know, I was so happy. Uh, uh, some things in my life I can never undo, I never change. But that one, I, I was able to sit down across from her and, 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 and thank her for making me uh, the man I am today and, and help me land a foundation that uh, I was too arrogant to a C at the time, but uh, uh, the foundation that allowed me to make that transformation, you know, in, in as we say, the belly of the beast, you know. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. is difficult, but she taught me what sacrifice was. She taught me what uh, principles were, the thing, you know. Uh, my mom was beaten and battered and, and, and did some, the horrible things that happen to human beings to make sure that we always had food on the table, uh, always had a roof over our head and stuff. And these were the things, you know, there was a time when I was going to school that actually, they taught me in school to actually disrespect and hate my mom and all the other women like her yeah. because of what she had to do, you know. And awesome. I know, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was just, this country has a great debt to be paid to, to women in, in particular, you know. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, I mean, I know that um, we forget that. We forget, you know, how much of our lives and our education actually has to be undone before we make space for really receiving wisdom, um, you know, and part of that and part of my path in doing that was to prioritize um, my relationship with you and Herman and, um, you know, and allow myself forgiveness and what you just uh, uh, said, accountability for the times that I got it wrong and and in doing so, we make space for transformation and growth, which I think your book, I got it here. This is the <laughs> uncorrected proof that, um, that I got before the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Um, and I do think your book, in a lot of ways, it reads like a guide for folks who maybe have never 
thought they were important or could plug into organizing our activism work. Um, and you know, there it go, and it goes deep. Like it's like the dream work in the sense that you know it's 101, and then it's like 400, 5,000. You know, um, because of what you were asked to endure and what you transmutated and transformed into not only this book but your life and legacy. And I wonder if you and Les were um, aware of it being and serving as a guidebook for young organizers when you were pulling all of these truths together? <laughs> you know, to be honest, Les would have to speak for Les, but yeah. I, you know, I just, you know, I just wanted this to tell this part of my life. I wanted, I, I wanted uh, people in America and around the world to know what had, uh, you know, been done to me, uh, how I had been living uh, a life that I had no influence or no control over. I had seen, I started to see myself uh, in, uh, in the eyes of uh, uh, the racists who shaped me through, you know, uh, politics, uh, economics, politics, social, uh, even, even religion, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so it was quite, I really don't think, it took me about, I don't know, I, I, by my own estimates, about 20 something years, 20, maybe 22 years to re-educate, uneducate, and then re-educate myself uh, and to the point where uh, I felt as though I had accumulated enough strength, enough wisdom that I could define the kind of human being I wanted to be. Mm. I could uh, de uh, develop uh, policies, uh, uh, principles, values, uh, you know, and core issues uh, within myself that, uh, as I said, you know, uh, I would rather sacrifice my life than and, and uh, you know, betray these things. Uh, uh, and I've tried to live my life that way. Uh, you know, Les and I uh, were talking the other day, and of course she, you know, uh, you know, I have a biracial relationship. And, you know, we teach each other a lot, but she has this concern that being an African-American man, and every time I walk out that door, you know, there's a threat that I may not come back. Yeah. Uh, and I think for any 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 woman, and particularly African American mothers, to live with that kind of constant threat in their life, that constant worry, that constant pressure of knowing when they their husband or father or uncle or child, you know, leaves out the door, uh, you know, are they ever going to see him alive again? And the thing about this, we are in a, a time in this country where you don't have to do anything to become a victim of white supremacy, you know. Uh, I recently read uh, uh, this kid that killed all those uh, people in, in Illinois. You know, he's out on bail now. Yeah, yeah. Washington. John, yeah. The, the family of those people uh, constantly suffering, constantly uh, dealing, you know, with what what the loss in their lives, and he's at home, you know, enjoying all the benefits and the privilege of being a white kid, you know, and you know some of the people that you 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 know. One thing uh, this uh, last election cycle has done, uh, it has really shaken me in a sense where people that I once thought it was safe to admire and safe to respect mm -hmm. have betrayed us, you know? Yeah. And I can't, I, I, I can't understand why, you know? Uh, a lot of these entertainers and rappers and stuff, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, why? <laughs> no, I'm why? not even gonna say their names. Yeah, I do know. Well, I'll say their names, you know, yeah. uh, 50 Cent, Ice Cube, Lil Wayne, and, and the list goes on and on, you know. Uh, 
what could possibly be motivating these people to do this to us? Mm. And, you know, I, I'm one of the, I'm, you know, I, I, I personally have a personal issue with African-American people because we don't do the things that we, that we should do, mm. you know? White supremacists in this country are doing everything that they need to do to suppress, oppress, and exploit African Americans, women, other minorities. You know, our response is not what it should be. You know, mm. what could Fifty Cent or Lil Wayne or Kanye West or some of these other betrayals of African American people and and working class people? What could they possibly uh, how could they possibly totally disregard us and feel that that is okay? And I've come to the conclusion that as African Americans, uh, we forgive too quickly and we forget too easily. Betrayal. Yeah. You know, I'm not talking about individual betrayal. I'm talking about the social betrayal. You know, and uh, you know, I. I did a, a small piece of, you know, uh, on, on, on Facebook in response to something I read. And like I say, you know, these people now, you know, I would rather walk barefooted than uh, wear the shoes that they endorse. So I would rather wrap my body in old dirty newspaper than wear clothes that they, you know, uh, that's, how, that's how personal uh, this betrayal that I feel uh, is a, a proper response, you know. Uh, uh, and it's been difficult for me because I see the system, particularly after America, still supporting these people. Mm -hmm. you know? And I don't understand that. I'm a, I, and that's really giving me a, a heartburn right now, you know, trying to understand how us as a whole don't see or understand the betrayal, yeah. you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, African Americans who rally around and embrace and support, uh, you know, uh, uh, and and I don't use this term, uh, but in quoting uh, uh, Malcolm X, you know, Malcolm said, you know, there's the field nigga and there's the house nigga, mm. you know, field nigga prays for. Uh, storms and locusts and everything that destroy the crops that he's forced to harvest. And the house slave, he, you know, he's prays for the wealth, the health and the welfare of the slave owner, you know, and he identifies, you know, uh, uh, with the slave owner, you know, and that's, and I see a lot of that going on right now. And I, I'm deeply wounded uh, by uh, the betrayal of some of these people, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that observation is really important coming from someone who arguably has been punished worse or more than any other living human. Um, but I also want to bring in a little Herman who used to um, remind us that you can't be dipped in shit and not come out stinking, right? And part of what makes y'all so remarkable at least from someone who has been, you know, in proximity to you for 20 years is that you never um, were, you never, you never stunk. I mean, you, you know, we definitely have moments where we would disagree. I'm not saying that I don't want to hold anyone up to God or the burden of godly status, but this idea that like the shiny objects that are so easy to to narrate and shift your whole identity around for some folks were never ever enticing enough for you guys to reach for, you know? And the lessons that you offered, which I think are also in, woven into the book um, are really that, you know, your integrity matters more than anything else, you know? And that, you know, that is a, a backbone or something to come back to, even in my own decision-making, it's like, do somebody just asked me this the other day as a young artist, like if this pro if a particular project is funded by someone with whom your politics, you disagree, but it's a certain amount of money. If you never had that money to do the project, do you say yes? And I'm like, fuck no, you say no, 
right? There are things that are, um, that are really, you know, um, go so far against and so clearly to those of us who have been in proximity to you and, and Herman and Walimu that it seems it's an easier decision to make. But I do think, you know, that 300 years of being uh, dipped in white supremacy or imperialist white supremacist, capitalist heteropatriarchy to bring in some bell hooks is a hard thing for, to shake. And I would argue that when you are visible in the likes of Lil Wayne or Kanye or 50 Cent, it, you become addicted to that kind of fame. And what I learned from you is that that doesn't, that will hurt you more than it will help you. And what matters most are these meaningful conversations that are organized around a robust feeling of love. What's that Shay quote? A deep, a true revolutionary is fueled by deep feelings of love, right? Yeah, well, you know, the most powerful feelings for me is the love of humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, uh, that allowed me to uh, work through some of the most horrific times. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Robin and I, uh, we, we, we had this conversation. And one of the most difficult things when we were doing speaking engagements and stuff was trying to give pe people want to know what was it like to be locked in a cell, nine by six cell, uh, 23 hours a day, uh, you know, and, and it, was, it was so difficult. Uh, if there was a silver lining in this pandemic is now we have a place of reference, yep. you know? Yep we can ask people, well, what, imagine how you had to, uh, you know, isolate yourself from friends and family, social activities stuff uh, since this pandemic, since March, uh, the, uh, you know, and then multiply that a million times. And, and you know, you yeah. know what it was like for us, you know. Uh, more often than not, uh, I don't know if it's a defense mechanism or what. I really don't dwell a lot on, uh, you know, the four, 44 years and 10 months of solitary confinement. Uh, I, I, I acknowledge that it's there. I still have uh, issues, you know, I still have claustrophobic attacks, uh, not as, as, as much as I was when I was in prison. And there are times when I wake up and, uh, uh, I'm confused as to where I'm at for, you know, yeah. however long it takes, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, but overall, you know, I've been out uh, in February uh, on my birthday this year, uh, next year will be five years, you know. Yeah. I never thought that uh, I would, actually, I never thought I would live that long, you know. Mm -hmm. I thought the system would find, see me as such a threat and it may still happen that, uh, yeah, you know, uh, you know, uh, they had to eliminate me like they did so many other great uh, African men and women uh, throughout history, you know, yeah, for taking a stand and fighting for for humanity. Yeah, I mean, this was definitely. I'm sure you remember the many times I tried to persuade you with my tears to you know, <laughs> flee out and come home because I was, you know, I just couldn't stand the thought of, of losing you. So I'm also grateful for all of the strength and tenacity and all the decisions you made to be here and have this conversation. Um, Fox, you brought in um, the quarantine that, um, you know, international quarantine that folks who have never even had to think for a second because of the burden of their privilege that they have never had to consider being in isolation or being in solitary. And um, Alicia Garza, who's the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, she has this really amazing podcast, Lady Don't Take No. So if you're ever looking for yeah. a podcast, it's pretty dope. And she opens it and she asks, what has Lady Rona gifted you what new habits have you picked up you know people are flexing like baking yeah. bread or whatever and I, I wonder if you've picked up any now you know after actually spending time in isolation now in social isolation 
any new well, habits? Actually, the, 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 the solitary confinement of prison has better equipped me to mm -hmm. deal with this than I, than I imagined, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, uh, and sometimes, you know, to, to, you know, I think by nature, I'm, I'm an introvert. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I don't show a lot of emotions, uh, no matter what's going on inside of me, but by discipline, I'm an extrovert because what I'm trying to do requires me to socialize and intermingle and communicate uh, on many different levels and many different ways with, you know, humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it has, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to sound blase, you know, but the, 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 the isolation part of this pandemic had not really affected me that much, you know, because mm -hmm. like I see, I'm, I'm accustomed uh, although I'm not alone, you know, Les and I live together. I'm accustomed to finding ways to, you know, day-to-day, uh, -day, move through days and nights and stuff, you know, and I have to remind myself time, you know, that uh, I live with someone who I love uh, as much as I love myself. Mm. And, uh, you know, she's a very uh, intelligent woman, very strong woman. And, and I owe it to 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 her, you know, to, to try to be more extra boy to, uh, uh, and, and not just you know sink into myself. So I think uh, that's the one thing I, I've learned. How forty four years and ten months of pain and suffering is serving me uh, at this at this particular moment in time. Yeah, thank you. And there's a lot of questions um, that we're getting in the Q&A and that I had gotten before this conversation about how you are negotiating quarantine and what advice you could offer. And I think you answered that. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm not calling you out here, Fox. Um, I know this is a new thing, but um, Les is amazing, powerful. Y'all are a power couple, but you forgot Hobo. And that's a yeah. We just we just adopted a, a this a beautiful terrier. Uh, rather, he adopted us about three going on a month. Uh, you know, less and less like to swim a lot. Yeah, and we live about I don't know 15, 20 minutes from the Lake Point train. So we uh, you know custom we go out almost every day, and she would swim, and I would you know sit on the on the bench and stuff and you know just watch over her and all the thing and one day we went out there and this little dog would just you know for some reason you know he kept sniffing around me but whenever i walked toward him he would you know would run away and put distance and so uh, you know after a while i'm like you know i'm just going back and sit down so uh you know i was walking back to the bench and i felt something you know, brushing up against my leg and I looked down and there's Hobo, you know, looking up at me and I went sit down and, you know, he, uh, you know, jumped up on the, on my, and put his paws on my leg and stuff, you know, and, and was sniffing, you know. Yeah. And, and so I just start walking around and he would follow me and a couple of couples wanted to know, was that my dog? I said, well, no, I don't know who he's for. And they said, well, can we, can we have him? Said, yeah, you, you know, you can have him, you know. And, but whenever they would go toward him, he would run away. They even tried to feed him, you know, and he was still, and whenever I'd leave, he'd come, you know. And so I'm like, well, when let's get out of the water, he's probably going to run, you know. It was so strange. Les got out of the lake and came to the bench. And he went over the less and he, of course, like the nature of all dogs, he started sniffing them. And yeah. he started licking on the leg, you know? And so Les, who didn't want a dog, you know, that's one of the bond of contentions between us about me buying a, a dog, you know? And uh, so she said, well, what are we gonna do? I said, well, when we leave, if he follow us and if he get in the car, we'll, we'll adopt him 
and we'll take him to the vet the next day and make sure he doesn't belong. You know, there's no chip or anything and stuff, you know. And so that's what we did. We went back to the car. And at first, he was running around the little parking lot area. And uh, Les said, well, why don't you just open the door? So I opened the door, and he came right there, jumped in the car, got in my lap, started licking me on the face and stuff, you know. And I'm like, yeah. I understand out. that dog. I yeah. understand him. Like, he, he knew he knew what was good for him. Yeah. Yeah, so, and now there's three. I love it. He, he had less wrapped around his paw. <laughs> and he it takes over the it takes over the house now. You know? Yeah, I love it. You can see him sometimes running in the background. Um, Fox, I just want to save a little bit of time with for this Q and A. I'm able to see it on my screen, and I don't know if you are, but I'll just read some of them to yeah. you. Um, Mr. Woodfox, is there any good news? Despite the difficult national context, have you seen positive signs for incarceration advocacy since your release? What's yeah, good? I think I, the good news for me is the, the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert and I, in harmony and spirit, We've been a supporter of Black Lives Matter for years. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, Robert and I have made it a point, wherever we went for a speaking engagement, to meet with the young men and women who were involved in Black Lives Matter movement. Yep. And we were, I think what was surprising is then we were in England and France and you know, even Belgium, and there were Black Lives Matter movement. So we had an opportunity to meet, you know, this is when Black Lives Matter was still scorned by uh, white supremacists in this world and, and who had a lot of influence in controlling the narrative of what Black Lives Matter was mm. uh, and trying to uh, demonize the movement and stuff, you know. Yeah. So that has been uh, probably the, uh, the, the biggest, you know, surprise, uh, pleasant surprise for me. Great. Uh, uh, since I've been out, you know, and I'm very, uh, you know, happy that uh, I had the insight to see the potential Black Lives Movement. I think, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you should remember, but the first panel I sat on uh, was in D.C. at the invitation of uh, a Congressman uh, Cedric Richmond. That's right. Yeah, as you know, it's just been... Uh, uh, Pointed uh, to the uh, president elect's uh, cabinet. Fox, I'm not sure if your microphone is on where your hands are, but it sounds like something is intervening with the mic. Try, uh, say some, okay. talk again. How, how are we now? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we are, uh, and I was on the panel with Alicia, you know. Yeah. Stuff, you know, uh, oh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if she remember, but it was, it, it, you know, and right off the bat, I was very impressed by her. You know, she was, uh, you know, it was like the power was just uh, generating uh, from her personality, uh, focus, and stuff, you know. Yeah. Do you see any relationship between BLM and BPP, Black Lives Matter, Black Panther Party? Do you see? Yeah, I mean, that was that was one of the things that drew us to the Black Lives Matter movement, that there was the similarities uh, between, you know, Black Lives Matter members uh, and, and the party, you know, the, first of all, the dedication to uh, the preservation of uh, African-American people. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, working class people and poor people uh, as, as a whole, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the unifying of uh, different ethnic members of the human race, uh, you know, these type of things, you know, uh, really impressed us. But the fearlessness of the young men and women who was in Black Lives Matter, you know, a lot of people, although, you know, the media, uh, 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 try to portray Black Lives Matter movements as being rioters and thugs and all that there, you know. 
you know, uh, people don't realize how much courage it takes to, to, you know, go out in the street and demand of your government, whether it's local or statewide or the federal government, you know, human rights. Mm. You know? And uh, I had the purpose, uh, rather the privilege of being in, in one of these marches uh, 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 in DC and uh it, you know that there was an exhilaration of being there being a part of this i've watched this for so many years on the news but there was also fear mm -hmm. you know because i knew at any moment you know this could turn ugly it could turn deadly you know yeah and so i you know uh it's one of the reasons i get sort of frustrated and angry uh, particularly when I see the conservative media portraying these young men and women uh, the way they do. And the thing that I'm so happy about is that white America, progressive white Americans in this country have embraced the Black Lives Matter cause and uh, are there. So they can't stereotype this uh, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, and they try to uh, uh, you know, uh, make it a one issue uh, a movement, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 you know, well, King and I go on speaking to game and, and, and people in the audience say, well, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the one thing I think is that it is not just about uh, killing black men on a regular basis by the, you know, police. Uh, 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 that is the focus point. The Black Lives Matter is a multiple movement. This is about economics, political, social uh, justice, you know, uh, stuff like it there, you know. So that's yeah. that's what drew uh, uh, me uh, to the Black Lives Matter movement, you know. The similarity yeah. between what the Panthers were trying to do and successfully did do for, you know, a brief period in history. And, and you know, uh, to be honest, I never thought that I would live to, uh, you know, see uh, what's going on in this country right now. You know? hmm. The good and the, the good, the bad and the ugly, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you did because you planted those seeds, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, you know. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm the only one who believes that. Um, I think we have time for one more question, Fox, and it's a dovetail from what you were just talking about um, uh, from an anonymous person. What do you recommend as a next step for people who are just learning about these issues? What is advocacy beyond voting? Get involved in social issues, social movements. Mm -hmm. uh, if a particular organization don't particularly impress you that way you want to be a part of it, start your own, you know. Uh, you know, Robert uh, uh, King had this uh, saying, you know, about throwing pebbles in the pond, yeah. you know, and uh, you got all these different people throwing pebbles in the pond and each pebble creates a, a, a ripple and that ripple becomes a wave and eventually it becomes a tsunami. And we all know a tsunami is a powerful force. And uh, since this is a human tsunami, we have the ability to control the direction and the, and the essence uh, uh, of, of this tsunami. So this can be, you know, so with all these different things, uh, pebbles being tossed in, uh, we have uh, the opportunity to create uh, a social uh, tsunami for change and for the preservation of humanity. Mm, I love that visual too. And because it plays into Walimu's tiny grains of sand, right? It's that, yeah. you know, like I think part of right? But we were successful in many ways as the International Coalition to Free the Angola Three. And one of the things that was so beautiful, which was of your and Herman and King's invitation was the diversity and not just race, age, gender, but our skill sets and the ways yeah. that we came together with a unity of purpose. 
Um, well, you know, uh, one of the, you know, uh, being a member of the A3 and being looked upon it for directions and, 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 and wisdom or whatever, you know, we had to deal with a lot of different personalities, you know. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so that taught, that taught us a lot, you know. But the thing that impressed me the most was no matter how different the personality and the clashes and all that, when it came to A3, everybody found a way to come together. That's right. To be a focus, you know, of, 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 of power uh, for freedom of, of the angle of the tree. And, you know, uh, I tried to maintain what, you know, I consider to be the core of A3. The mm -hmm. people were there before, you know, the international recognition and acceptance and the nationwide, you know, uh, I think I, I, you know, of course I don't spend as much time as I'd like to, because uh, I'm always, you know, involved in something. But uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm very happy, to, you know, that I'm able to be able to maintain friendships and relationships with the core of uh, three. So you know, I, yeah. that's. I mean, yeah. I would love to call some of them in here with Shana and Bryce <laughs> and Anita and Bracken. Marina, Bracken, you know, like Bracken Bracken lives in, in Florida now. Yeah. You know, Shana, uh, uh, I saw Shana, Les and I went by this co op around, mm -hmm. uh, uh, can't think of the name of uh, the hall on St. Claude Street. Okay. And, yeah, we ran into Shana, you know, and her daughter, Zuri, you know, and all. Zora, Zora. Hey, yeah. yeah, I even got a a picture. I ran into him on Mardi Gras right there on the early in the Claiborne, you know. Uh -huh. So yeah, you know that's great. You know, of course, you we we occasionally get together, and 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 Emily uh, uh, and Jen, you know, who, who's very good friends. Occasionally, we uh, before the pandemic, you know, we have lunch. Uh, Ashley Warnstrom, uh, you know, all all the core people. You know, I've tried to maintain a relationship uh, and let them know, you know, how, how important they are to my life, you know, and my freedom. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, as one of those folks, I'm, I'm 20 years deep here um, in this relationship. And it's hard, it's, for me, it's also hard to believe, you know, I think I, baby Jackie was 28 years old when I met King, right? And started writing you and Hooks and I'm 47 now on my way towards 48. Crazy, it's crazy to say. <laughs> and, um, you know, the orbit around not only you as the human being and the human doing, oh no, here comes the emotions, but your teachings has been the greatest gift of, of my life, Wood Fox. And I hope that the way I live my life feels, you feel that reflection while you're able to, so that we don't have to go back, you know, 10 years and say, I'm sorry, you know, but that you see it in my everyday thoughts, words, and actions. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, you know, you, you I consider you to be a very, very close friend and I have a great deal of respect for your commitment to social struggle and the preservation of humanity. Now, I think you did a wonderful job. Like I say, you have you have uh, destroyed this myth that art is independent of social struggle. Mm -hmm. You found some wonderful ways over over the decades to uh, you know to interject artistic uh, talent uh, as an expression of. Uh, the, 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 the wrongs that, you know, happening in, in, in society and around the world. You know, uh, Solitary Garden mm -hmm. is a wonderful uh, expression of, uh, you know, art and, and social struggle being uh, uh, united together. Uh, the Harmon, you know, Harmon's House and so many other. I remember when, uh, when you came up with the concept to build a prison cell, and got, you know, it was so amazing that you got people to spend an hour in that cell for 24 hours for a 24 hour period, you know. And those were the kind of things that uh, 
caught the eye of, uh, now she's no longer with us, but Anita Roddick, you know, who was by any stretch of the imagination, extraordinary. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, yeah, she, and you know, these were the things, some of your artistic uh, creations were the thing that caught her eye and piqued our interest and, you know, made her eventually become an international coalition. Mm. Uh, and go to tree and therefore giving us, uh, in my opinion, you know, uh, opening up and uh, the hall of hard work that all of y'all had did in America, she introduced it to the international community, you know, right. because of her, her weld and her connections and stuff. Yeah. And I even was able to persuade uh, uh, Amnesty International, who Robin and I still do work with, yeah. uh, to take on our case. And, and our case was the first of its kind that Amnesty had ever been involved in, uh, you know, and as a result of that, uh, they're still doing some, some, some good work, you know. Oh, they definitely are. I mean, I, I, I feel kind of awkward now, but I wasn't, I was opening the door for just gratitude uh, towards you. And I thank you very much for what you said. You say it to me in all the ways that are unspoken. Um, in the way that you love me, in the way that when the worst tragedy imaginable, when I lost my baby this year to gun violence, you were one of the first per people here to receive me. And in the way this, that you keep going, Fox, and I think, you know, this book um, is just, it's just one, right? But it's, you know, when I talk about abolition and being an abolitionist and people are like, well, how do you do that? You know, for me, it begins with eye contact and the ways that we engage and build community and express that um, belief in each other, in the best of each other um, and, and create space to, um, to let go of the desire to punish. Um, and, and I think those are the very first steps. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one thing, you know, a lot of people, they ask me, are you angry? Or why are you not angry? Why are you not bitter, you know? And, you know, I, I you know, uh, the one thing life has taught me is that anger and bitterness and hatred eats up so much energy, you know, until you're in a constant state of exhaustion, you know? Whereas, uh, 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 moving past, you know, uh, the wrongs towards a noble cause, uh, and in this case, my noble, noble cause is the fight for humanity, you know, which I uh, learned from Nelson Mandela. Uh, you know, uh, I remember him saying, uh, not verbatim, but, you know, if a cause is noble, you know, you can carry the weight of the world on your shoulder, you know, and I think the fight for humanity is a noble cause. And until the ancestors, you know, asked me to uh, come join uh, uh, them and, and, and I get a chance to hug Harmon again, you know, and hear that laughter, you know, uh, I'll be doing this, you know. And then there's my great grandbabies, you know, uh, who I love dearly. And I don't want, 30 years from now, I don't want them fighting this same battle. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd like to think that, you know, what I'm, what I'm doing now on a personal level is paving the way for them. And on a social level, uh, helping humanity to realize the potential for, for goodness and greatness that we have. We just have to have, be strong enough to push back against the evil forces in this country, in particular white supremacy. You know? Ashe. I will say as someone who, you know, has been playing air guitar with solitary confinement for almost 20 years now, I've never been incarcerated. I don't plan to be incarcerated, um, but I hopefully have been contributing to the world you just described for your great grandbabies. That one of the most important things you could do is find yourselves an elder, find yourself someone who has lived the experience and who believes that we can and, and will do better and then don't let go. So. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, you know. yeah. so with that Fox I, I really want to thank um, 64 parishes 
parishes, parishes, 64 parishes. Come on, Jackson. Um, <laughs> the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities for giving us the opportunity to catch up, chop it up, and um, to offer um, your voice to the world. Congratulations on this award and all the awards. And I love oh, you. By the way, don't oh. go nowhere. Let me get my award so you can see. Hey, OK, OK. Oh, it looks heavy. It is, yeah. <laughs> Did you receive a bowling ball? What is that? <laughs> All right. Yeah, Ooh. this is it, you know. Hey. I this, love it. This is so beautiful, you know, and Miranda and Aaron and the camo. And, uh, you know, I'm deeply honored by this, you know. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. Like, like all the other awards, it wasn't something I expected, but it's something I truly uh, appreciate, you know, the honor, you know. Yeah. And I hope oh. well, I will continue to live up to uh, the, the, the principles and the values of the Louisiana Endowment of Humanities, uh, you know. Albert, we're not going to let you um, get away. <laughs> so, <laughs> you are now you are now firmly in our circle and i just want to thank jackie thank you so much for being such a beautiful beautiful interviewer hmm. and you too albert i think um our audiences even though we can't see them they can see us and they are blown away by your strength and your sense of hope um, hmm. for the future and uh, black lives matter we are so glad you joined us today and we hope that the audience will join us for future conversations with the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, anytime I can do anything to help or uh, uh, LEH, uh, please don't hesitate to call. You know. Okay. Well, y'all, thanks again. Thank you so much. Y'all be here today. Bye, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.